Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Egg Whisperer Show. This might be one of the most excited I've been interviewing somebody, and I've wanted him on the show for a really long time. I have Dr. Zahir Murhi on today's show. Hi, Zahir. Hi, Amy. How are you? I'm doing great. We're kind of the same. We both have Z's in our name. I know. <laughs> and we both help people get pregnant. <laughs> Actually, everybody calls me my neighbors, and everything calls me Z. But oh, I couldn't use the word Z in my office because Dr. Zhang, my partner, they also call him Dr. Z. So he kind of stole my name, but it's okay. Got it. So it's Dr. Murphy at work, Z yes. at home. I love it. So the title, the title of today's show is At Home IVF, PRP Ovarian Rejuvenation, and Ozone Sauna Therapy with Dr. Zahir Murphy. So tell us about yourself, your practice. Where can people find you? Tell us about yourself. Sure. So my name is Dr. Zahir Murhi. I'm a fertility specialist at the New Hope Fertility Center in Manhattan, New York, in Columbus Circle. We, and I'm actually, uh, in addition to this, I'm a professor at SUNY Downstate, and we just started an REI fellowship. So I'm the fellowship director for uh, uh, SUNY Downstate University as well. Um, I do a lot of, I'm, I'm also the IVF uh, research director at New Hope Fertility Center. That's awesome. I mean, I, I, I look up to you. So thank you for all you do, teaching future generations of fertility doctors. That's awesome. So why did you go into medicine and more specifically fertility medicine? Well, it's honestly, you know, I was, the ob field all was amazing. And, um, and when I was finishing my, my residency, I had to choose between gynecology, oncology, and fertility. And, you know, when I was doing the oncology part, even though I like the surgery part, at the end, you know, you lose patients and you get attached to them. So it was a little bit, you know, uh, depressing to me because I get to know the patients and it's sad when you lose them. So that's why I like the happy ending and having babies. I think it's, it's an amazing thing. And everybody around me, I have to tell you, uh, friends, family, they all did IVF at some point. So I feel like I was naturally born for this. <laughs> Yes, I do believe it was in my DNA as well. So we can definitely relate on with that. So you are the founder and inventor of At Home IVF. Can you tell us what is it? So I'm co-founder, Dr. Zhang. Okay. Myself, we both, um, uh, you know, came up with At Home IVF, and it's a, it's a, it's it's the outcome of I would say ten years of of research, right? Because um, you know the, the history started with. Dr. John Zhang, who started the mini IVF, which is gentle stimulation, less shots, mostly pills, plus or minus a couple of shots. Then Dr. Zhang and myself, when I joined New Hope, we came up with something called needle-free IVF that finally it evolved to at-home IVF. The at-home IVF is basically a summary of all those. It's, it's like the iPad or iPhone, if you want, <laughs> of all these Blackberries or whatever. Now, um, that's, that's the history of the at-home IVF. Now, the at-home IVF, you know, people think, oh, I'm crazy. No, I'm not. <laughs> people were like, oh, why did you, you know, how can you do IVF without monitoring? Well, first we need to know what's in the kit before we jump to conclusions, right? Now, the IVF and the conventional IVF, people take shots. So there's a risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which a lot of eggs, and that can be severe and deadly. But with the at home IVF kit, there is zero shots. So really there is no reason to monitor and there is no risk for the patient's life or anything like that. So I'm not crazy, <laughs> number one. Number two, <laughs> uh, number two, you know, it has no needles. So patients who are afraid of shots, and I can tell you, one of the main reasons why Dr. Zenga and myself came up with this is because I'm afraid of the shots. I can show you videos of nurses making fun of me when I take the flu shot every year. They literally have to pin me in the corner to give me the, trigger, the, 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 the flu shot. So there is no shot. So that's amazing, right? Number two. Number three, because there is no risk of hyperstimulation, you really don't need to come to the office to monitor. 
So it's ideal for the COVID-19 era where this kid, you know, we take history from you as a patient. You know, a lot of patients have done IVF somewhere else, so we tell them to send us everything. So first we want to have a clearer picture to make sure that the patient is safe and healthy to undergo IVF. Two, once, you know, we have all the records, we will send the kit to the patient's house and the patient start on the third day of her cycle with the pills, which mostly are Clomid and Letrozole combination. And it could be one pill of each, two pills of each, or three pills of each. And then the patient around day um, 11, 12, the patient will take nasal spray instead of Lupron trigger shot or Ovidrel. And then she comes just on the day of the egg retrieval. It is amazing. Now, I wanna make it very clear that it works beautifully for patients who have a regular cycle and beautifully for patients who have PCOS. But women with very low ovarian reserve might not work for them very beautifully, especially those who have a regular period. If you think about it, most patients ovulate on day 14. So you really bring them back on day 13 after the trigger shot, you're gonna get eggs on 90% of patients. And they, they, you know, people are like, oh, you're not gonna get a lot of eggs. True, but guess what? You get a lot of embryos. And I do believe, um, I never believed in this before I came to New York Fertility Center, I have to tell you. I do believe that the less stimulation you get, the better quality eggs. I've seen that. We have a patient who did the home IVF during the COVID-19, which is still now. Her name is Omolola. And the reason why I'm saying her name is that she gave me the permission and signed a consent to allow me to talk about the, her experience. We did the at-home IVF kit. We got eight eggs and four blastocysts. So... That's amazing. She did not take any shots. So, so to me, it's amazing. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, you, at least you're trying during the COVID-19 quarantine in order not to waste a month. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, don't pay for the kit. We're not going to charge you for the kit. We right. don't make money. Anyway. And, and that's you, that, you just answered my question beautifully. Who is it for? And then do you do an ultrasound before you do the retrieval? to know if that patient should go through the retrieval or not? Absolutely. We do blood and ultrasound the day of. Now, I have to tell you, maybe 5% of patients or less than 5%, they ovulate. And maybe a couple of percent, they did not take the nasal spray properly. So really, they did not trigger. And we don't get egg because even though the follicles are there, the trigger shot, which is the final maturity shot, did not really work for them very well. So that's why you know I always tell patients that it works 90% of the time, 95, but not for everybody. So yeah. that's, this is how and, it works. And the reason why I love this approach and the reason behind it is, you know, so many women are counseled or told to freeze their eggs by the time they're 25. And you and I both know that those shots can really cause a lot of discomfort and pain. And it could take a while to recover from that. And a very simple approach like what you described can be a solution and a young woman doesn't really need more than eight to 10 eggs frozen for themselves when they're going through egg freezing. So I can tell you that if my daughter was going through egg freezing at the age of 20 to 25, this would be an approach that I would want her to consider uh, using. Um, I like to do IVF and as pain-free, I wish I could do needle-less IVF and not have to monitor levels with shots um, you know, you know what I mean with blood draws, but this is a great, great solution. So you mentioned being able to get with that patient that gave you consent to talk about her story, eight eggs and several embryos. What about pregnancies? Great. So I have to, you know, her embryos are right now being run for genetic testing. So I'm not going to lie to you and tell her, oh, she's pregnant unless I don't want to jump to conclusion. I really think she's going to get pregnant with four blastocysts. So I want to keep it you know, give you update on the patient as we move along. But we have a lot of patients. She's not the only one. The reason why I'm talking about her in particular is that she gave me the consent because she was so excited. She wants her story to kind of, to be told to other, to other people. Now, one other thing that also I'd like to mention that if patients are afraid of blood draws, um, they want still to monitor and it's okay. We do the, the, uh, the urine, uh, the blood and, uh, I mean, sorry, the saliva and urine testing instead of doing blood. So we do the um, FSH and LH hormone in the urine and estradiol and progesterone in the saliva. So that also is, is an alternative for people who are afraid of the blood draws. That's a separate story, but I'm just saying, you know, we can still uh, accommodate patients who are afraid of the needles. 
That's amazing. I mean, I tell patients, I, I want to go through IVF. I, I design treatment cycles as if it were happening to me. And I love how you've basically done the exact same for your patients and you don't have a uterus. <laughs> <laughs> well, some people think I'm but anyway. <laughs> I love it. I get, I get moody sometimes. So they're like, oh, you're PMS. <laughs> so I want to transition now to something else that is very popular out there. Patients talk to me a lot about it. And I figure you are the very best person to talk about it. And that is PRP ovarian rejuvenation. What is it? Great. So I'm going to tell you a little bit the history of the PRP ovarian rejuvenation before I come to the conclusion as to why I decided to actually perform it on patients. Because I don't like to do anything that make patients pay without me counseling her properly as to why I'm doing it. Now, the PRP or platelet-rich plasma, it's patient's own blood. Take patient, blood from the patient, couple of tubes, we extract the platelets and the plasma. And then it started over a decade ago by being used for athletes for joint injuries and musculoskeletal problems. Tiger Wood and all, they all have PRP for their knees and ankles and all that. Then it evolves. Now it's used for so many things. It's used for hair loss. I've had a lot of patients who, I saw it. They came with like few hair and then they come back after the PRP and like I did PRP on my scalp. It's used for vaginal rejuvenation, for facial rejuvenation, so many things. Diabetic food ulcer, some uh, dentists now are using it. Now five years ago, a group in Greece, so we have to give them credit, they started to give it in the ovaries um, of women you know, who have very low ovarian reserve, I thought they were crazy in the beginning. But then they started to publish women who have menopause and premature menopause. One of them actually was 46 year old and got pregnant after PRP. So what they did, they take blood, extract the PRP, they go vaginally and inject the PRP inside the ovaries. Now, why and how does it work? There are two mechanisms. Mechanism number one, the PRP has or the platelets and the plasma have a strong growth factors. Remember, there are protocols still now used, which involves human growth hormone, which is a growth factor that patients take. So that, multiply this by a thousand, you're basically taking the patient's own growth factors, putting them inside the ovary. Now, if a patient is menopausal, what, she has no eggs? No, a lot of people think she has no eggs, but that's not true. Amy and I know that Women postmenopausal, they still have around 1,000 eggs that are dormant inside their ovaries, and that's established. I'm not saying anything new. So the PRP stimulates some of those follicles, or primordial follicle we call, to wake up, and then we can collect them. That's mechanism number one. Mechanism number two, it's debatable, but some scientists think that the ovaries have something called ovarian stem cells. They're there. And these stem cells are cells that don't have a function yet. And the, the PRP, when you stimulate them, they wake up and they get a function. They can turn into younger eggs or younger smaller follicles. Now, uh, you know, so scientists are debatable on this, but that's the only way that explains why is someone who has no period, now we're getting, after the PRP, good quality eggs and they're getting pregnant. Now, does it work for everybody? No. Can I tell you before, when, before I meet you if it's going to work for you or not? No, you have to try it first. Now, before the PRP, what I used to do, I used to do modified ovarian rejuvenation, which is I go in, just puncture the ovary with no PRP. Because mm -hmm. I thought in the beginning, well, the PRP is going in the blood anyway and going to the ovaries. Why do I need to take them out and inject them? It's, I thought it's the fact that you're puncturing the ovary, causing bleeding that increases blood flow and growth factors. I was partially right. But this, the studies that came up in 2019, you know, they really convinced me that the PRP itself is adding a huge value to the, um, you know, to the ovarian response. There's a group from um, at the ASRM, which is our annual meeting in Philadelphia in 2019, uh, a group from, um, I can't remember who, but uh, they're very decent researcher and scientist. Emory is one of the people in Yale is on the, Abstract, they looked at 152 women before and after PRP, and they showed that the number of follicles almost tripled, the number of FSH went down, AMH went up, uh, they had double the number of eggs, 
an almost 40% increase in embryos formation, and they're all very low ovarian reserve. So, and then there are other studies that look, they took follicles of women, put them in addition the lab and added PRP and they showed before and after. So that's all these studies in summary convinced me that, you know what, it might work. And that's why I started doing it. You know, I want to make it very clear that I've had patients three years ago begging me to do it. And they're like, I'll pay you $10,000. I'm like, no, I don't feel comfortable doing something unless I have evidence for this because uh, I'm an evidence-based guy. So that's the, um, you know, history of the PRP and the way it works. So who is it specifically for? Who do you think is the best candidate for it? Is it the 46-year-old woman or is it the 39-year-old with low ovarian reserve? You know, Amy, this is a great question. I don't know. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not, I know because I've noticed, I've noticed a lot of, I've noticed, believe it or not, that some of the women in their 40s, they did better than women who have very low ovarian, uh, premature ovarian insufficiency. You know why? Because the premature ovarian insufficiency, which are menop menopause before the age of 40, and you know they're usually young, for some reason, they might have some genetic issues like fragile X, premutation, that, that probably predispose them to respond less to the PRP. Again, I do not have evidence for this. I'm guessing in my head and I'm thinking out loud. So back to your question is, anybody can do the PRP. I've had patients who had bad quality X and had much better quality X following the PRP. Whether the PRP is working like a human growth hormone that's given in a lot of protocols, it's actually plausible. And it does make sense because we know human growth hormone does work for women with low ovarian reserve or poor egg quality. So, and also I'm doing it for women who are late, even late 40s, you know, patients, I, can, I cannot mention her name, but 47 year old came to me, she had no period for six months, did the PRP, she's not from New York, the PRP went to her state that had sex two weeks after the PRP and got pregnant. You know what? I can't even tell you. She's one of the nicest patients. Everybody was excited. But I've had patients who are much younger than her. It didn't work for them. So there is, it seems there is some genetic factor. It's like the coronavirus, you know, for coronavirus that no one knows who it's killing. They say there is race and genetics and same thing. I really, hard for me to tell. And I always tell people, you need to try it. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't work for you, I want to make it very clear from the beginning that it's a 50-50 chance, I think, for it to work. So this, you've actually seen success in women over the age of 45 have a healthy pregnancy? One so far with yeah. a PRP. That's, I mean, even at 47-year-old getting... She had intercourse. She didn't even do IVF. Well, yeah. I mean, the likelihood of a 47-year-old getting pregnant is like 0. 0.0001%. Correct. I mean, it's so low. Right. And that's an, a pretty incredible story. And I admit, I mean, I think of it as a scam. I think of it as totally crazy. But then I did go to GoDaddy.com and I bought every PRP website, IVFPRP.com. <laughs> <laughs> No joke. I mean, I researched how to do PRP in my own office, but I just didn't feel after reading the Greek studies, I just didn't feel like, I think they report like one out of 800 cases was positive and there were three pregnancies and only one live birth and one live birth was still having regular periods, something like that. I don't quote me on that. So I didn't feel like it was fair to offer it to women, but knowing maybe I'll change my mind because hearing you talk about all the research you did before you decided to offer it, and especially that story you tell me about the 47-year-old woman, I definitely don't want to mislead or misguide people, but it might be something for patients to call you about. So if, let's say, a patient of mine wants to reach out to you, would that be possible if I wanted to send them your way? Oh, absolutely. Look, again, I, I agree with you that maybe this woman who did the PRP at 47 and got pregnant Maybe she could have had pregnant by herself without doing the PRP, right? This is an, maybe, and I do believe in, in, in evidence-based medicine, and I do believe that we need an answer by doing trials, right? Um, and more basic science research. We are currently doing basic science research on PRP. We're taking, we're granulosa cells from women undergoing IVF, splitting them in half, treating one with control, one with PRP in order to look at steroidogenic enzyme genes that produce estrogen, all that, because I want to know myself if PRP mechanistically how it works. Okay, so that's, but yes, I'm more than happy to help patients or viewers who are interested in the PRP.
Awesome. And then can you tell us a little bit about the patient experience when they're doing it? How does it feel? Are they asleep for it for people who want to know? Um, so patients come, it, it's a two hour procedure. Patient comes, uh, she, we take blood. She comes without food or drink in the morning. We take the blood, we process the PRP. It takes like an hour and a half. She'll be waiting in the lobby. After an hour and an hour and a half, we take her to the procedure room. Our anesthesiologist will give her propofol, which is a very light sedation, so she won't feel the broken. And then like an egg retrieval, instead of sucking the egg, now I'm injecting PRP inside her ovaries. And about how many um, punctures in each ovary are you making? I do, I try to do between five and 10, um, you know, and I try to distribute the PRP all over, you know, the cortex area of the ovary, because this is where the eggs are. So I, I try to, ex, you know, increase exposure to, uh, to, to the eggs as much as possible. Awesome. Well, very exciting stuff. I'm not done. I still want to talk to you more. And the next thing I want to talk to you about, because you're so amazing, is ozone sauna therapy. I mean, it sounds like going to a spa. So what is that all about? It is like a spa. It's actually a very comfortable uh, m machine. You go naked in it, and then you cover yourself. Only your head is coming out, and the ozone flows throughout your body. There's a vaginal hose, small tiny hose, that your patient puts vaginally. It infuses ozone in the vaginal area as well. Now, we have studies on this. We've done We've done study preliminary with, you know, on patients without charging them anything the first six months before we started to implement it. So I want to make it very clear as well. Um, ozone is like the oxygen that we breathe. The oxygen that we breathe is two oxygen molecules. The ozone is a third oxygen molecule. It, the ozone layer is the layer that covers the earth from the UV light and all that stuff and protect the earth. Now, ozone sauna therapy or ozone, let's call it ozone, ozone therapy has been used since World War I. This is not something new. They used to sterilize the instruments that they did surgeries for back in the day with ozone because ozone is a very powerful antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, anti whatever you want to do. One. Two, the ozone works as anti-inflammatory agent. It lowers body inflammation. It's used for a lot of inflammatory disorders. It's given rectally for women with ulcerative colitis. And I, I have patients who've done that before. Um, by the way, a patient told me about the ozone sauna therapy. I didn't, I didn't know what it was a few years ago. Wow. Just blame her. <laughs> then then uh, patients, they inject it with a needle, the ozone inside their knee, patients with, with arthritis. It's given, uh, what else it's given? For dermatologists, they use it for uh, psoriasis and... Um, eczema and stuff like that. Uh, so it does have a lot of multiple uses. And um, we at New Hope were the first to use it for fertility. Um, a patient came to me, like I said, three years ago, and she told me, why don't you buy, why don't you do ozone for your patients? I'm like, what is ozone therapy? And I actually, I started to read about it. And then what we did is that we looked at patients before and after ozone. Patients, the session is half an hour. It's actually very relaxing. Your body becomes warm and you sweat a lot. And then patients do half an hour session twice a week for around three weeks, which is a total of six sessions. And then what we did is I looked at the cohort of women who have very low ovarian reserve before ozone. They did IVF, which is cycle one. They did ozone for three weeks. Then they did IVF, cycle two. And I compared the outcome of cycle two to cycle one. They actually had similar number of eggs. But after the ozone, they did more embryos, significantly more embryos compared to before. So this tells me that it did do something good to the egg quality that potentially could you know, improve outcome. We're still, we're doing um, you know, studies on basic science. Again, I'm having granulosa cells put in the ozone machine before and after, and I was supposed to present back in October at Vancouver and the SRI. I had a, a, you know, my presentation accepted, but unfortunately the meeting was canceled because of the COVID-19. So we are continuing our research. I have a PhD student who's, who's her topic is ozone because she actually got pregnant only on ozone. So it's personal to her. Also it's used for women with thin lining. Ozone is a very powerful vasodilator. It increases blood flow to the uterus. Uh, we did publish a study, you can look it up, it's on PubMed, regarding women, it's a small, a small case series 
women whose lining was so thin, you're talking about three to four millimeters, they were told you'll never get pregnant, you need a surrogate or gestational carrier. They did ozone, two of them got pregnant. So look, the reason why we're doing these things, the PRP and ozone, because if we don't do something different, you know, patients are not, first of all, science is not gonna move forward. And I feel like, okay, it's enough. Like everybody does the same thing, conventional, conventional IVF. It's time, to, I think, to do something outside the box because everybody is different. We're trying to individualize IVF. We're trying to make it more patient friendly. And also, you know, our focus is mainly when we're with low ovarian reserve because a lot of women, you know, are waiting because women are very successful and very, you know, you know, they're busy. They don't want to, you know, and some people cannot have money right now to freeze eggs. So yes, it's sometimes too late for some. So those patients, I think we need to do something experimental for them in order to increase their chances of having a baby using their own eggs. Awesome. And is there, is ozone something that people should consider doing prophylactically or, or as a preventive measure? I'm just thinking out loud or something that they should, you know, meet with you, get some information about their fertility levels, and then you incorporate it into their treatment. I, you know, I recommend it for patients who have poor LVF outcome. You know, I, I, as far as recommended to everybody, I don't think it to me is, is ethical and you know, make people pay for something that's not really recommended. I really would like to use it for patients that are, I don't want to say difficult, but difficult cases where I, I ran out of everything, you know, like I, I want to do something else hoping to help you. So, so yeah, I'd like to have a consultation, talk to the patient first uh, and on a case by case basis. I also am interested in looking at ozone sauna therapy and endometriosis pain. Because endometriosis is an inflammatory process, and a lot of women have that. And ozone is anti-inflammatory. I've had a patient who has endometriosis, and by chance she told me her pain got less when she did ozone. So this is how I'm thinking, well, we should really start to study ozone and endometriosis. Fibroids, again, I'm, I also would like to see if it shrinks fibroids, but you know, step by step. <laughs> right. Well, I love your passion. I love what you're doing. I love how you're being so creative for your patients. I can only imagine how much your patients love you. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Not all of them. 95, 99% <laughs> of my patients love me. 1% outstand me, but that's okay. <laughs> Well, I hope you'll come back and do a live Q&A with us because I, I have a feeling that a lot of our audience that is watching this would love to talk to you and ask questions um, during a live show. Will you come back and, and join us for that? Me, I'll go anywhere. Thank you. And then just... I won't fly though. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us again, where can patients find you? Tell us about your clinic, your website, where you are, all that kind of stuff. So you can reach me on uh, a new, at New Hope Fertility Center uh, in Manhattan, New York. You can go to, on my Instagram, uh, Zahir Merhi 7, Z-A-H-E-R-M-E-R-H-I 7. You can, you know, send me text or, or find me there. Um, and um, I think that's, uh, that's how you reach me. Awesome. Well, good. Well, I have a feeling you might have more people reaching you after this interview. More than happy. And thank you for everything. Well, thank you everyone for watching today's show. Join us next time. Have a great Bye. day, everybody. Bye. Amy. Bye Zahir. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert Dr. Amy Abazadeh, and you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 